So thank you guys so much for uh, coming out on kind of a chilly, wet day. Um, thank you guys for venturing out a little bit in the rain. Speaking of rain, I noticed nobody's sitting here at these tables up here. You don't want to sit in the spit section. I mean, I could, I could probably hit these tables right here with a little spit action. All right. Um, so thank you guys again for coming out. We are in the middle uh, of our study on the attributes of God. So tonight we're actually going to cover three attributes, but they all have one thing in common. Okay. But before we get there, I want a show of hands to this question. How many of you guys like to work on your own car? Okay, so, a little, yeah, a little more. Yeah, so I see some of you going, man, you know, have these on that one. All right. How many of you uh, like to do projects on your own house? Okay, okay, so a good uh, two-thirds, three-quarters there. When you guys work on your houses or your cars, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that what's usually the cause of the problem? Is it because you did something drastically? Not necessarily, it might be you got in an accident, but usually it's just normal wear and tear, right? Like, I gotta replace this, I gotta do regular scheduled maintenance, gotta change the oil, gotta change the brakes. Hey, this thing, this wood over here is rotted, gotta replace it, because over time, things just wear out. Yeah, oh yeah, the wife always gonna, you know, make that honey-do list there, and the honey-do list keeps growing. Especially uh, if you're retired, whew, that honey do this can get pretty big. Um, so what are some of those things you feel? Like when I see it, I'm like, oh, I got to do this again? Why can't this thing just stay fixed? Like I'm thinking about building a new house because then, oh, well, then you don't have to deal with any problems. Well, lo and behold, problems will probably come after the first year. Everything settles. Drywall probably cracks a little bit as the house gets situated and all that jazz. It's kind of like unavoidable. Things will start and they'll end. They'll begin, right? You get a brand new car right off the line and lo and behold, they'll end up falling apart, okay? As some people, I remember this phenomenon a couple years ago, people uh, put it out online, planned obsolescence. That, oh, they build cars, they build phones to fall apart so that you have to come buy a new one. I don't know if that's true or not, but either way, they're falling apart, all right? Age. So some things do, though. Some things get better with time, right? Like, <laughs> did somebody say me? Wow. <laughs> all right, then. Uh, that was not the example I was thinking of, but sure. Uh, like wine is supposed to get better with age, right? Um, but there are plenty of things that don't get better with age. Uh, I was going to say, usually your body is not getting better with age. Your mind maybe doesn't get better with age. Um, then there are things that, are there any things that you can think of that do not start? If you took a minute, I'd, I'd be a hard time to say, like you started sometime, right? You haven't always been around. Uh, some might feel like, man, I've been around too long though, okay? How about some analogies? for something that goes on and on and on. Like I can picture a wheel, a wheel that just goes downhill, keeps going downhill, it just keeps going downhill, it keeps going down. I can picture that, but in reality, that the hill ends somewhere, right? Um, another analogy, a river that just keeps flowing on and on. As far as you can see, there is no beginning and is there, there is no end because you're standing at the river, you're just looking at it. Or the ocean, it's just vast, right? And you think, well, gosh, where does it end? You, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't end. It's just an impression or a clock. A clock starts, and if you've seen one of those old grandfather clocks, it just keeps ticking, just keeps ticking, but eventually you're going to have to wind it up, put some new batteries in it, something. There's problems with all these analogies. So how many of you guys heard the sermon from Pastor Todd, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before on the Trinity? Okay, he offered up several analogies of, oh, the Trinity is like a three-leaf clover. Oh, the Trinity is like an egg. The, all those analogies fall short. They all have problems. How are you going to describe God who sits in a category all by himself? If you're going to try and come up with an analogy, you're going to have problems. So God sits in his own category. So the first attribute we're talking about tonight is 
eternality, that God is eternal. He always has been, he always is, and he always will be. There's never been a time when he was not around. He was not created. So I don't know about you, I've had this conversation with several uh, people over the years. Well, God created us. Well, then who created God? Well, then who created that person who created God? And then like you keep going on and on like, well, if you keep going, you can never keep going on and on. Otherwise, nothing gets created, nothing happens. But we all can tell that there's things that exist. He did not start. He was not created. He existed before time was even a thing. That's what we mean by eternal. Because if he's captured inside of time, then he would be bounded by time. He travels through time and exists at any time. We, we change over time, right? Um, I'm getting a little bit of this here, a little patch right here. Um, I change over time. He does not change over time. That, that's something that is hard to get my mind around because everything I see changes, right? This big, beautiful building, you let it sit here for a couple hundred years, it'll change drastically, right? Anything I can think of in this world changes. Our lives transpire in a sequential order. I'm born, I grow up, I go to school, I get married, I live, and then I die. I, my life happens in a sequential order. That's not the case for God. He sees past, present, future. All of it is readily available for him to see. He's every when, but he is not located in just one time frame. Like for us, we want to say, oh God, call out to me right now. But like David called out to him 3,000 years ago, people will be calling out to him in some time in the future as well. He hears and sees all those prayer requests and he's the one who can direct the course of history to be sovereign, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. So I want you guys to open up and we'll look at a couple of passages about his eternality. Open up to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26. I'm just going to read one verse here in this passage. Isaiah 26, verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever. For in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. So everlasting. God is forever and ever. Amen. These are statements to describe that God goes on and on and on and on. He is an everlasting rock, which is a good thing because I need something like that. Okay? Turn over with me to Psalm 90. We're going to read a good chunk of this psalm, Psalm 90, 1 through 6. Okay? I know there's a little bit of flipping. It won't be a ton. But I want you to see that these ideas, these terms, these words we use are not just here and there in the scriptures. It's all over the place because we're talking about the very nature of God that he is eternal. So Psalm 90, verses 1 through 6. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. So we get this kind of sense of, wow, God is from everlasting to everlasting. It's kind of, you're capturing a huge amount of time there. One last passage, way in the back of your Bible, way in the back, the book of Revelation. Revelation, first chapter. Okay, and I promise we'll take a pause from flipping around for a minute. Okay? 
So Revelation 1, verses 4 through 8. This is what the Apostle John is saying to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we've got this sense of a scene in heaven where John is being told, angels are relaying messages. We see God who was, who is, who is to come from everlasting to everlasting. These are just great pictures because when I see all the things around me that change, I need a rock that does not change. So I need something like that that's substantial enough who isn't surprised when issues pop up in my life right if he's if god is just up there sitting waiting for like life to transpire and he's like oh gosh that one caught me off guard i wasn't ready for that one that that thing that happened to your life that would be a huge problem right but a god who sees all these things and who knows how to intervene in our lives we don't get to see it, right? We don't get to see how God is going to answer it, but we can have comfort, we can have strength, and we can have security because we have a solid rock on which to stand. Since God is perfect with respect to time, he sees all of it, he knows all of it, we can have these things. They don't, nothing surprises God. He's seen the course of man and he knows the ebb and flow of history. He's the one who's directing it. Some of you might have heard that history is his story to write. He's aware of the plight of every generation that happens. Nothing escapes his notice. He also knows the inappropriateness of boasting, right? Where is boasting? It is set aside. If I boast in anything, let me boast in the Lord Jesus. Those are the words from Paul. Because who am I to boast when I am just this much of the vast expanse of time that has happened? And this also goes with some of his titles. The very first week we talked about titles. I'm going to bring up some more for you guys to consider that go with his eternality. This is a nice old-fashioned term. He's a bulwark. A mighty bulwark is our God. He's a rock, a fortress, a refuge, a dwelling place, and he is the only wise God. So those are titles, often you'll see them in the Psalms. Okay? God will account for justice and judgment even if we don't get to see it. He sees that he's going to bring things and make it right, which helps me to have perspective. Lastly, for eternality, I think when you see false gods, like when Isaiah speaks or Jeremiah speaks or Ezekiel speaks, They're going to talk about false gods and false idols because they are not like Yahweh. They're not like him at all. And they're rightly torn apart because they're wood and stone. All right, these are false gods. Okay, they cannot answer the prayers. They cannot, even though they might be carved with ears, they don't hear prayers. Even though they might be carved with a mouth, they don't speak truth. Okay, so there's one other term that goes with Eternality is a seity. So this is one of those words you toss out, you know, you're at a a little cocktail time and, hey, here's a fancy word, make yourself sound like amazing. It's not really that fancy, and I bet you've actually heard of this idea before. So it's a Latin phrase, a se, he is, he is. So how many of you guys are familiar with Moses in the burning bush. Moses and the burning bush. So it's a story. We're not going to read the whole story right now. 
But it's a story in Exodus chapter 3. Okay, if you want to check it out another time, Moses turns around and says, hey, this bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. I got to go check it out. What is this? He goes over there, has a little bit of interaction with God, and he says, Moses, I want you to go deliver the people. What am I supposed to tell them, God? Who should I tell them has sent me? What is your name? And he says, tell them I am. I am who I am. He is. He just exists. And this is what we mean by a seity, that God exists. He does not depend on you or me, right? He exists whether you believe he does or not. That's why, okay, I have a discussion and trying to demonstrate that God exists to an unbeliever, an atheist, whatnot. Okay, he, he will and he does exist for good reasons, for good revelation from the scriptures, and he exists in and of himself, which is quite different than all the other gods of all the other religions. Because often, like you pick a Greek or Roman god, what do you get? Essentially, you get a bigger version of a guy. He just happens to be a little more powerful, but they're still like having sex with other goddesses, and they go here, and they have temperaments, and they, they're essentially just a bigger version of a flawed human. Okay? He exists. He is and it goes right along with, he was, who is, and who is to come. Creation, right? Does he need it? No. Does he need your praise? No. Is he completely satisfied before creation happens? Yes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing in perfect unity, and harmony, and love from all eternity, the universe would then be completely gratuitous, extra, an overflowing of the character of God to say, we choose to create something, another create a creation so that we can exhibit our character. We have another object to love. We can show ourselves glorious. They can enjoy us. Okay? I'm using plural terms because I'm talking about a trinity. So, it's kind of a, wait, so you don't, like, you don't depend on us, okay? If you've seen, like, uh, like movies with mythology and whatnot, the gods are usually have more power when there's more um, adherence, right? Like, that's kind of something that happens in popular, that's not Yahweh. He's not, like, rising and falling on our praises. He's not oh gosh, man, if they would just tell me how good I am, I'd really appreciate it. I need a confidence booster. No, he, he said that's not him. He has all glory and power and honor. Okay, third one, inscrutability. Yeah, well, man, we're really busting out those fancy terms tonight, okay? But inscrutability is, again, another delight that you get to have. So, a great way to describe this, I think, is you'll be in heaven, you'll be walking along for a thousand years in heaven. I don't know how you keep track in heaven, but okay, just go with it. You're walking along with God for a thousand years in heaven, and then God says, hey, have you considered? I'm also like this, too. Here's a new thing for you to explore for the next thousand years about my character. You'll never come to the end of who he is. If you keep digging and digging and digging and wanting more, you'll never exhaust it. You'll never come to the end. That's what we mean by inscrutability. There's always more to know, experience, love, and be in the presence of God. So I want you guys to turn over with me to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Picking up in verse 18, Isaiah 40, 18, and then we're going to read down to verse 23. Okay? To whom can you compare God? To what image can you liken him? A craftsman casts an idol, a metalsmith overlays it with gold and forges silver chains for it. To make a contribution, one selects wood that will not rot 
He then seeks a skilled craftsman to make an idol that will not fall over. Like also known as the idol has to be, have a flat base. Otherwise, the God that you're representing with the idol will tip over. Seems kind of dependent upon you to get it right and the craftsman to do his job. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you since the very beginning? Have you not understood from the time the earth's foundations were made? He is the one who sits on the earth's horizon. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers before him. He is the one who stretches out the sky like a thin curtain and spreads it out like a pitch tent. He is the one who reduces rulers to nothing. He makes the earth's leaders insignificant. Who are you going to compare him to? You definitely can't compare him to some petty little idol that you think you can manipulate. You can't compare him to, oh, I, if you have this thing, give it to me. I need you. Like, he's not needy. He's not insecure. He's none of these things. He is infinite. And that's the thing that ties all three of these together. Eternality, a satiety, and inscrutability. He is infinite. He's infinite as it relates to time. He's infinite as it relates to he is not started. He never started. He always has been. And he's also infinite where we are finite, right? Like, I have a limited amount of wisdom. I have a limited amount of understanding. And I'm going to allow for God to say, you're infinite, okay, he's infinite. There's a gap here which creates mystery. Maybe I can't know everything. Am I going to be humble to say that? God, I can't know everything, but I I know that you've given me plenty of you to understand. You've given me fellow men to help me understand who you are and walk with you. That That big gap there creates mystery and sometimes in life, I know it'd be easier if the mystery wasn't there and he would just answer every question I ever have. But that would mean demanding him to come down to my level and also making him in my image instead of God makes me in his image. Okay? So, another passage I want you guys to turn over is Ecclesiastes 7, and this will be the last one. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So in chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. Chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing. It benefits those who see the light of day, also known as those people who keep on living. Wisdom benefits those people. For wisdom provides protection, just as money provides protection. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves the life of its owner. Consider the work of God. For who can make straight what he has bent? In times of prosperity, be joyful, but in times of adversity, consider this. God has made one as well as the other, so that no one can discover what the future holds. So he's going to say, this is his way of saying, there's mystery. I cannot know what the future holds, but I can know who holds that future the Lord God Almighty, who sees beginning to end and knows the affairs of men. So, there are lots of actual applications. I've already mentioned a few, that he is our comfort, he is our strength, he is our solid rock on which to stand when troubles avail me, because he is infinite. Okay, you guys will have some time to discuss more application at your table and to see other verses that are listed there as you guys have time at your tables.